In every play, there is a lesson. And I don't mean the theme or meaning that the playwright wanted you to get, or that Mr. Renshaw will definitely quiz you on in class the next day. And I don't even mean the lessons of empathy and good public speaking that you get just from the very nature of acting experience. What I'm talking about are the lessons that I've learned from my personal experiences in theater. I've been involved in almost 20 different shows in my time at Oak Ridge. And each one has been different and rewarding in different ways. So today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I see as some of the most important lessons I've learned from theater. First, I'd like to take you back in time to ancient history, September of 2012. It was the fall of my freshman year and my very first fall play, Macbeth. Now, those of you who know me a little better know that I have a certain affinity for Macbeth in that I am completely obsessed with it. It's been one of my favorite shows ever since I first saw it at TCU's Trinity Shakespeare Festival. So when I found out I would have the opportunity to be in it, I was determined to play my dream role, Lady Macbeth. Now, was it exceptionally naive of me to think that I could play a role like Lady Macbeth at age 15? Yes, absolutely. But I guess you can't fault my sense of ambition. Funnily enough, ambition is also an important theme in the text of Macbeth. Vaulting ambition, which or leaps itself and falls on the other. For obvious reasons, I did not end up playing Lady M, which was disappointing at first. But in hindsight, it is an absolute blessing. Had I had the role, I would have been in way over my head because I didn't have that much training or experience. And honestly, no matter who you are, you are just not ready for a role like that at 15. What I learned from this experience is that sometimes casting or in a greater sense, just things in life, won't really work out the way you want it to. But more often than not, if you're willing to take a step back and really look at the situation, you'll see that there are good reasons that you didn't get what you want. You can't always get what you want, but sometimes you might just find you get what you need. I know it's really cliche to quote the Rolling Stones right now, but um, my mom and I are really big Stones fans, so that one's for you, Inger. <laughs> Fast forward to the fall of 2013, my sophomore year, and I was ready for my next fall play. I was not, however, ready for what that play actually turned out to be, because the play in question was The Love of Three Oranges. For those of you unfamiliar with the show, let me clarify the scope of just how insane this show was. This first image is of me, the king's loyal advisor, giving my king advice on how best to help his ailing son. This next picture is also of me, but this time as a valley girl donkey taking an onstage selfie with a dead witch, a rope, and Austin Pettigrew in drag. These pictures are from the same show. Aside from being just utterly bizarre, Love of Three Oranges was also endlessly intimidating because it was a heavily improvised show. And none of us really had any real experience with improv, so I wasn't sure how comfortable I was with the idea of being on stage with no idea what was going to happen next. But I loved my experiences in Love at Three Oranges. Doing improv was crazy amounts of fun, and I picked up a lot of tricks on how to make up lines and keep a scene moving, which really comes in handy because, honestly, whenever you're doing live theater, you never really know what's going to happen next. You just have to respond, react, and keep the scene alive. So now, whether I'm on stage with no idea what's about to come out of my mouth, or taking an environmental test with no memory of anything other than recycling is good, I have my Love of Three Oranges training to rely on, which has taught me that sometimes the best you can do is just make something up and move on. My Love of Three Oranges training really came in handy for the following fall play, Life with Father, because a week before our show, the person playing our male lead changed, and Caleb Badgley was now playing Clarence Day Sr., or Father. Now, anytime you're playing a character whose name is mentioned in the title of the show, it's pretty much a given that you are going to have a ton of lines. So when someone comes up to you on the Monday before Thursday opening night and says, oh, by the way, your father now, you can bet there's a little bit of anxiety involved. Plus, with Caleb now playing father, Nick Fom had to step up and play Caleb's old part. And Austin Pettigrew had to come in and play Nick's old part. Now, Austin's new part only had one line, and that line was, how do you do? So he didn't have the same amount of stress as the other two, but Still, for our opening night, we had three actors playing completely different roles with only three days' notice, which meant that the rest of us, still in our original parts, had to use our knowledge of the show and our characters to keep the show moving, 
because at any moment, anything could be said or done. Now, the lesson I learned from this experience sounds pretty cheesy when I say it out loud, so at the risk of sounding like a Lifetime movie, I'm going to keep this one short. What I learned from Life with Father is that with hard work, you would be amazed what you can do, and in very little time. Anytime Caleb and I were free, we were running those scenes into the ground until we knew it well enough to perform. And whenever someone didn't know something, someone in the cast stepped in to help their castmates and pull off a show. And in the end, we really did pull it off. Maybe at times the audience could tell that something was wrong, but at least no one seemed to notice just how badly we mangled Act 3, Scene 2. A scene so mangled, in fact, that to this day, none of us are supposed to talk about it. <laughs> Sorry to board. Moving back to my sophomore year for a moment, my best friends were Ashton Murphy and Paige Levine. And when we selected student directors at the end of the year, who should be selected as directors but the very same Ashton Murphy and Paige Levine? Now, I'm sure all of you have, at least once in your life, had a friend kind of be telling you what to do and you just have this moment of, oh my god, stop, you're not the boss of me. Well, the thing is, when your friends are your directors, they actually are the boss of you. So learning to take direction, and in some cases just take orders from people you consider to be your peers, colleagues, or even close friends, can be uncomfortable. And I'm sure Paige or Ashton would gladly tell you it took me some time to get used to the new dynamic. But my experiences in these shows taught me something important about how to deal with a change in power structure. Sometimes someone who you were once on completely level ground with will get promoted over you, or head a committee that you're a part of. And it's up to you to respond appropriately and keep working as hard as you can at whatever it is, even if it makes you uncomfortable sometimes. Once I learned to work under my friends, still giving my input but taking their word as law just as I would with any director, I was a part of two amazing shows, and that turned out great in the end. For my last show today, I would like to talk about the last show I ever did on the Oak Ridge stage, Richard III. I was super excited when I found out we were doing Richard, because it would bookend my first and last fall plays for Shakespeare shows. And I had heard a rumor that Mr. Colley was planning on gender bending, which means that all the women were played by men and vice versa, which would mean that I would have the opportunity to audition for Richard, an incredibly interesting and complex role that I would have loved to play. Now, by the time auditions came around, Mr. Colley had decided not to gender bend, but I was still pretty determined to play Richard, so I auditioned anyway, and somehow ended up with the part. What I learned from this experience is that people will always have a reason not to give you something. In this case, I couldn't have really faulted Mr. Colley if he hadn't cast me as Richard, seeing as Richard is a middle-aged man and I'm a teenage girl. But whether the reasons are valid or not, there will always be obstacles on the path to something valuable. Mr. Colley took a chance on me, and I worked hard every day to prove to him that he made the right choice. When these things happen, the best we can do is work as hard as we can to make people look past the reasons that they shouldn't give us something, and instead see the reasons that they should. As you can see, I've learned a lot from my years in theater, not just about acting or storytelling, but about life. And while all of you haven't had the same experiences in theater that I have, I'm sure that these lessons apply to your lives as well. And I'm sure that you've learned these lessons, or lessons like them, from your own hobbies and passions. Because when you're passionate about something, and you really dedicate yourself to it, you would be amazed just how much you can learn from that thing and just how well those lessons will stick. Thank you.